When I was little, the Pokemon games hadn't even come out yet. Instead, all we had was the Pokemon Cartoon Show, and every kid with both a TV set and a pulse was immediately hooked, myself included. Back in those days, the most amount of monsters you'd see in a show was like 7 or 8, but this one had 150? Even better, the greatest cartoon of all time was coming out with the video game? Now, even as a first grader, I was still hesitant about my excitement. I'd played games based off of movies and cartoons before, and I wasn't sure if the Pokemon game would really capture the magic of the TV show. Little did I know, the cartoon was actually based off of the game, which had released in Japan two years earlier. Then, after getting good grades on my report card, my mom promised to buy me Pokemon Red version, and my life had suddenly changed forever. Now, let's fast forward to today. There's like 80 different Pokemon games now, some of which are obviously better than others, but I know I'm not alone in thinking that the original two released in America, Pokemon Red and Blue versions, are to this day the best games in the entire series. In fact, there are so many of us that the community has collectively given us the derogatory term, Gen 1ers. Now, is that fair? Personally, I understand. I know people who have never played any of the other titles and still claim that Red and Blue versions are the best in the franchise. I just want it to be known that that's not me. I've played every core series game, except Ultra Sun and Moon because heck that entire generation, and my favorite games are actually a tie between Gens 1, 5, and 6. As for the latter two, I'm willing to admit that I have my own personal biases towards those two. When it comes to Red and Blue, however, I believe that there are fundamental reasons as to why it stands out in comparison to every other Pokemon game released. Reasons other than nostalgia. So if you think that Gen 1 is overhyped, watch this video, and maybe you'll start to see why people like me love it so much. So before I get into why this is the best game of all time, let me address some of the criticisms of the first generation. Since this game originally came out on a handheld console from literally the last millennium, there's bound to be some limitations. Having a backpack that can only hold 20 items can be a huge hassle. You have to deposit key items like the SS ticket and the card key into your PC just to make room for all the stuff you find on your journey. When you catch a new Pokemon, not only do you not gain any experience, but you have to heal it after taking it out of the box. TMs only work once. There are two HMs that are required for the overworld that have basically no use in battle. Special attack and special defense are merged into one category. Critical hits are unfair. Mount Moon exists. These are all issues that have been addressed in later generations, and I believe that by fixing these issues, the gameplay has improved. That being said though, there are some issues that I see some people complain about that I don't feel like are actually issues at all. Yeah, rap was broken in Gen 1. At least it still had a purpose. If you were frozen, the only way to thaw out was to use an item or get hit by a fire type move. I personally think that was a way better mechanic than what we have now by turning it into a pseudo sleep function. I've also heard people use the fact that the original was buggy just as a way to attack Gen 1ers. Uh, can you name one time the Mew glitch negatively affected your experience? Can you tell me how exactly being able to catch Pokemon in the Safari Zone outside of the Safari Zone made you have less fun? Remind me how having an infinite amount of rare candies made you suddenly not want to play anymore? Aside from focus energy not giving you critical hits and the move Lick not being strong against psychic types, the bugs made Gen 1 even more fun. Now that that's out of the way, let me go into more detail about what makes Red and Blue the best games ever. First of all, anyone who watched the TV show growing up will remember Gary Oak and how he was constantly one step ahead of Ash and the gang. We all remember what a pretentious jerk he was, and when we played the game, we had it in our minds to show this punk who was really the top trainer in Palatown. Now, some may argue, that's not Gary, that's Blue, they're totally different. I mean, whatever helps you sleep at night, man. But the main takeaway is that this game nailed the rival perfectly. Personally, I liked Silver in his own right, and the whole gang of X and Y had their own unique charm that I enjoyed too, but Arrival is something that's been consistent throughout the Pokemon generations, and Red and Blue have done the best job making your rival memorable. You grew up together. You got your Pokemon together. Yet throughout the entire game, he was always one step ahead of you, always belittling you, and at the very end, you beat the Elite Four just to find out that he's the new champion. This isn't just a rivalry anymore. 
Now it's a battle to see who's the best trainer in the entire world. So far, no game has been able to top that kind of experience. Another thing that this game does really well is how they implement the space between the main areas. When you go from town to town, you aren't just going through a long patch of grass that has new Pokemon in it. You're getting an entirely different experience that matters in its own way. When you go from Cerulean City to Bill's house, you go through the iconic Nugget Bridge, where you're rewarded with the top selling item in the game once you win. If you go to the left, you get a small patch of grass where you can catch an Abra, the most elusive yet powerful Pokemon in the game. If you go right, you get to choose which path you take to get to Bill, which in turn lets you choose which trainers you want to battle. Just as a side note, Red and Blue also solidify the choice battle mechanic, something that none of the other generations have been able to mimic. Especially since starting with the very next game, you go from strategically choosing which trainers to battle to trying to run away from trainers. When you travel to Fuchsia City, there are two different paths you can take to get there, each with their own fun little twist. Each path meant something. It wasn't just filler with more Pokemon until you get to the next place. Every path mattered just as much as the destination, which is something that I hope the future generations of Pokemon realize so that they can go back to what worked. Another thing that no other Pokemon game has been able to capture is the right levels. In your very first trainer battle, they start you off against two Pokemon that are both level 6, and by the time you get to Brock's gym a mere three trainers later, they're level 12 and 14. Let me just re-emphasize, if you've battled every single trainer in the game up to this point, you've only battled four trainers, not including your rival, and they're already past level 10. When you battle Koga for the fifth badge, his Pokemon are just as strong as they are when you battle him in the Elite Four in Gold and Silver. Steven's Pokemon are weaker than Agatha's. The only champion that can even rival Gary is Cynthia, but the path to get to her is an absolute cakewalk. Diantha technically has the highest levels, but do we really need to go into how easy it is to gain levels in X and Y? Plus, the Elite Four up to that point only had four Pokemon each. It's not exactly hard to build your team around Diantha's and gimmick your way to the champion battle. Red and Blue encapsulated the level system perfectly. They gave you plenty of trainers who you could choose to fight or not, while giving you specific landmarks with Pokemon just strong enough to make sure that you're taking your journey seriously. It lets you choose how you want to grind, and it rewards you for it, unlike in games like Gold and Silver where you're battling level 2 Pokemon all the way up to your third gym badge. Speaking of choosing what path you want to take... Red and Blue are the most open world games in the entire series. Yes, there are linear paths that it sets you down so that it can guide you where to go next, but it also gives you a world of freedom. After Rock Tunnel, you can basically do whatever you want up to Giovanni. I mentioned this before, but there are two different ways to get to Fuchsia City. You can take the bike path, or you can go south from Lavender Town and go through a gauntlet of trainers. Honestly, either way is a unique experience and is a lot of fun. You can take on Erica, Sabrina, and Koga in any order you want, and if you beat Koga first, you can take on Blaine before even challenging Erica. This is the only game where you can do that. Heck, the Safari Zone alone gives you an adventure similar to what you'd find in the giant wild area of Sword and Shield. Of course, it's not nearly on the same scale, but it's still an adventure that you look forward to. There are paths all over the game that you can choose to go through or not. Don't feel like going through Diglis Tunnel? You can go through Rock Tunnel Blind. You don't feel like doing the Game Corner? Get the Poké Doll. Don't feel like taking off Saffron City's second gym? Skip it. If you decide to go through them, however, you get rewarded. You can catch Diglets and Dug Trios, which turn out to be the fastest ground type in the game and eventually learn friggin' Earthquake. If you decide to take on the Fighting Dojo, you get to have one of the best fighting Pokémon in the game. In fact, it's only through exploring that you manage to find Pokémon like Eevee and Zapdos. This is the only generation where you get significantly rewarded by traveling outside the established path that the game lays out for you, and it makes the journey so much more fun. Finally, I know this is kind of a weak argument, but Pokemon Red and Blue have a personality that you just don't find in any of the other games. It's not trying to piggyback off of the success of its predecessor, it is the predecessor. The sprites are filled with a unique charm, trying to be cool in a new way before Pokemon developed their signature art style. There are elements in this game that you can't find anywhere else. There's death in this game. You can gamble in this game. 
you can catch every single legendary, and not just the ones that are on the cover of the box! With every new path, you're genuinely saying to yourself, do I want to add this Pokémon to my team? And at least for me, the answer is always, yeah. This is something that I only get in Red and Blue, and maybe a little in Gens 5 and 6. When you play Red and Blue, you're not just thinking about beating the gyms and getting to the Elite Four. The gyms are necessary, but they're only a step in your main goal, to become a Pokémon Master, someone who's caught them all and has built the strongest team in the world. So, what do you think? What's your favorite Pokémon generation? Do you have any thoughts you'd like to point out? Leave a comment to let me know, and I'll see you guys next time.